Experiment 21 in Chem 1212 is called the thermodynamics of borax dissolution, and the ultimate goal of this experiment is to determine the thermodynamic parameters associated with the solvation of borax, or sodium borate, in water. So there will be three big parameters that we're interested in determining for this process. And that's delta G, which is the change in free energy associated with solvation, delta H, which is the change in enthalpy, and delta S, which is the change in entropy. We're interested in these three quantities for this process of dissolving sodium borate in water. Now one of the amazing things about this experiment is that to determine these theoretical parameters, all we need to measure ultimately are volumes and temperatures, and we can use our knowledge of thermodynamics and of chemical reactions to determine the parameters from there. So the things we'll be measuring are volume and temperature. That's going to lead to concentrations in moles per liter, and these will be equilibrium concentrations, meaning that we can determine from there KSP, or the solubility product equilibrium constant, and from KSP we can get back to delta G, delta H, and delta S for the process. So if we want to determine the equilibrium constant associated with the solvation of sodium borate, the first thing we need is a saturated solution of sodium borate at equilibrium. So that's going to be the first thing that students will do in this experiment. They'll take essentially a beaker, a known amount of water, and they will dump in as much sodium borate as it takes to completely dissolve in the water that they add. It's really, really important that at the end of the process, right before students go to titrate, that there is some solid borax left in the bottom that ensures that the solution over top is saturated, right? And it needs to be saturated if we want to be in an equilibrium situation where we've got as much sodium borate in the water as possible. To pull aliquots from the top of these solutions and titrate them to determine concentrations. This will be done at three different temperatures, 0 degrees, room temperature, and 50 degrees C. And I'll mention for the 50 degree C beaker, make sure it does not go above 50 degrees C because the sodium borate will start to break down around 60 C and you don't want that to happen because that'll mess with the equilibrium constant, right? So make sure that you stay at 50 degrees C as close as possible. So with the saturated solution of sodium borate in hand, the next step is to figure out how much borate is actually in the solution. So let's talk a little bit about the borate anion really quickly. So the borate anion has the formula B4O5OH4, and it's a dianion meaning it's dibasic. So solutions that contain the borate anion are going to be basic, right? Namely, this saturated solution up here, it's going to start out as basic. And so I'll go ahead and mark that over here. If we introduce an indicator to this saturated solution of sodium borate, it's going to appear its basic color, right, or in its basic form. But as we slowly add to it an acid, and the acid we'll be using in this experiment is hydrochloric acid, the pH will start to shift to acidic. And what you can imagine is happening here is, and I'll go ahead and change this to two equivalents, two equivalents of HCl are reacting with that borate anion, and I'll just abbreviate it as borate over here, to form the acidic form of borate, boric acid, and, uh, and I'll put that in quotes because it's not really this, but close enough. And Cl minus, two equivalents of that. And so we can see that on this side now, we're in an acidic situation. Particularly as you add more HCl after this reaction has gone to completion, the pH is going to shoot up very rapidly. So at the moment when the indicator changes from basic to acidic, we can be reasonably confident that the amount of borate in the solution is half of the amount of hydrochloric acid that we added. And that's the key to this titration stage. Now this is actually the second stage of the experiment. Um, this is what students will do after they've learned something 
about this HCL solution that they'll be using. We want these measurements in the titration stage to be as precise as possible, but that requires really accurate and precise knowledge of the concentration of the HCL solution that's used in this titration phase. So prior to doing the titration, students are going to do what's called a standardization. So let's take a moment and talk a little bit about the standardization. So in the lab for this experiment, you'll see a bottle, a reagent bottle, that says something to the effect of 0.1 molar hydrochloric acid. And this is something that's made up in the stock room, uh, but quite honestly, people can be sloppy. Concentrations are never going to be exactly what they say on the reagent bottle. And if we're interested in thermodynamic parameters, as we are, that's kind of the goal of this experiment, right? We want to know as precisely as possible what is the concentration of that hydrochloric acid. The way to determine this is to use an irreversible chemical reaction and the fact that we know the amount of another reagent involved in that reaction to back calculate the amount of HCl that was involved. So hydrochloric acid is an acid, of course, which means that we can treat it with a base to cause an irreversible reaction and a shift in pH. So again, we're going to be using an indicator to tell us when this reaction has gone to completion. The specific base that we're going to be using is sodium carbonate. It's a nice white solid, pretty easy to handle, dissolves well in water. And the products of this reaction are actually two equivalents of NaCl, carbon dioxide, and water. So the carbonic acid that's formed initially breaks down into carbon dioxide and water, and you'll see lovely bubbles form as this reaction occurs. One more thing, add two equivalents of HCl react with one equivalent of sodium carbonate in this reaction. So it's an irreversible reaction. So if we start with a known amount, and this is key, this is going to be known, students will mask this out, amount of sodium carbonate in some amount of water. In fact, the amount of water doesn't really matter. I think the lab manual specifies 50 milliliters. Then when the indicator makes the jump from basic to acidic, we'll have added some volume of this HCl solution and we can use the known, let's say, number of moles of sodium carbonate. We can use the known NSC and the known, because we measured it, volume of HCl that we added from a burette to ultimately calculate the concentration of HCl in this so-called 0.1 molar solution. So you might mention to students that the concentration they calculate ought to be close to 0.1 molar. That's a good sanity check. If they're off by an order of magnitude or more, something's gone wrong. Uh, but the basic idea is to use this known number of moles of sodium carbonate, which really comes from a measured mass of sodium carbonate, right? The volume of HCl that was added, measured, to calculate the concentration of HCl. And this is that key molarity that's used in step two during the actual titration to ultimately calculate the concentration of borate in that saturated solution. So the standardization phase is really important. And the two phases of the experiment look very similar. So I think it's really important to emphasize to students the difference between the two stages and the purpose of each. Ultimately, if you, we could distill this down to one ultimate purpose, the purpose of standardization is to determine this HCl concentration. Whereas the purpose of stage two is ultimately to determine that concentration of borate in the saturated solution using the same experimental methodology of titration, but titrating the borate anion instead of titrating a known amount of sodium carbonate. And in that titration, in stage two, kind of the roles are switched. After standardization, we now know to great precision the concentration of the acid. What we don't know and what we want to find out is the concentration 
of that borate anion. So after all of this titration business in stage two, how do we calculate the thermodynamic parameters? Well, there are six key pieces of information that students are going to bring out of stage two. That's the three temperatures and the three corresponding concentrations of borate in those saturated solutions of borax at those temperatures. So we'll have the three temperatures, 273, that's zero degrees C, 293, that's roughly room temperature in the lab, and 323, which is that 50 degrees C figure. And for these concentrations, I'll just abbreviate them as C0, C20, and C50, where the subscripts refer to the temperatures in Celsius. Now, these measured concentrations lead directly to KSP, that's the equilibrium constant associated with dissolution. And to see why that is, we can write, I'll write over here to the side, the equation, the chemical equation for the dissolution of borax. Sodium borate solid goes to dissolved sodium ions plus one equivalent of that borate dianion, also aqueous. The equilibrium constant for this reaction, we can write that expression as the concentration of sodium ion squared times the concentration of borate, where the squared comes from the fact that two equivalents of sodium show up. Now, borate dion dianion concentration, obviously, we know directly from these Cs. But what's a little bit less intuitive is that we also know the sodium ion concentration, recognizing that that needs to be twice the concentration of borate 2 minus. So using just C0 as an example, what we see here is that 2 C0 squared times C0, where that second C0 comes from the borate concentration, is equal to KSP. So we can calculate the KSPs at each temperature directly from those borate 2 minus concentrations. So we might denote these as KSP0, KSP20, and, and KSP50. Now from each of those, we can then use the relation that delta G is equal to negative RT natural log of K, in this case KSP, to calculate three delta Gs. And I'll throw these off to the side. Delta G at zero, delta G at 20, and delta G at 50. So there's one of the thermodynamic parameters. And delta G depends on temperature, right? We ought to expect it to change with temperature. And so we'll have three different delta Gs for the three different temperatures. Now, how do we get delta H and delta S from here? Well, delta H and delta S don't show up in this relation right here. So we need to bring in another helper. The helper here is the idea that delta G is equal to delta H minus T delta S. That comes from thermodynamics, right? It's a fundamental thermodynamic relation. It's sort of the definition of delta G from the perspective of thermodynamics. And so we can actually equate this definition over here with the negative RT natural log of KSP that we see over here. So doing that, delta H minus T delta S equals negative R T natural log of KSP. Now we can use this relation to determine delta H and delta S. And to see how that works, let's divide through both sides by T. Delta H over T minus delta S equals negative R natural log of K SP. And I'll do one more small manipulation and divide both sides by negative R. So we get negative delta H over R, and I'll split off the 1 over T for reasons that are going to become clear shortly, plus delta S over R equals the natural log of KSP. If you stare at that for a moment, you'll realize that that's the equation of a line provided we treat as the X and Y variables, let's say, let's treat the natural log of KSP as the Y variable and 1 over T as the X 
right? So ask yourself what the slope and intercept of this line will be. Well, the slope will be negative delta h over r, and the y-intercept will be this delta s over r. So to determine delta h and delta s, all we need to do is take these ksp values, take their natural logs, plot those versus 1 over the temperatures, way over here. That should give a line. r squared will be pretty good. And the slope and intercept of that line give you delta h and delta s directly. So again, miraculously, from nothing but a bunch of volume measurements and some calculations and knowledge of chemical reactions from there, stoichiometry calculations, thermodynamics calculations, we can pull out delta G, delta H, and delta S for this process of dissolving borax in water.